I think I saw some bouncing happen <laughs> in the room. I don't know if it was dancing. You've heard of the term rhythming in churches. It's good to celebrate. My hands are a little bit numb. Are yours? It's good to involve more than just our presence or our voices even in worship. It's good to involve all of our whole hearts and souls. Pray that we keep doing that. Pray that we do that too as we open scripture. I hope you know this is participatory. This isn't just me speaking. It's all of us hoping to hear from the Holy Spirit together. I don't often enough say this, but please pray while I speak. If you pray, two things happen. I speak better and you hear better. <laughs> I want to invite you to turn with the Bible to 1 Peter. And we're continuing a series from the book of 1 Peter, um, chapter 3. And I'm picking it up in verse 8. And I've been sharing with you this theme that for me emerges out of this whole book. And I introduced it by saying the truth. This is one of my favorite books. Because it gives us instructions for the real world. It doesn't deny the fact that this world is difficult and harsh. And it even opposes us as Christians. More and more, I think, believers who are willing especially to stand on the truth of scripture are seen in a negative light in this world. And not just as sort of a separate group, but even as dangerous in the world. Do you notice that? And I think that's something we really need to pay attention to. Uh, first Peter, the context of first Peter is one of persecution. So in order to be serious about your faith, it meant that you had to give up a lot of things. You gave up social status, you gave up economic privilege. In some cases, you gave up your freedom or a connection with family. Uh, and for many, they gave up their own lives, including the author of First Peter, Peter himself, who was one of Jesus' disciples. I actually started this series before Easter, and I talked to you about the failures of Peter, as well as the successes he ends up with his greatest success, really, at the end of his life when he proves his discipleship, if you will, by dying for his faith. And so Peter knows something about sacrifice, and he knows something about the struggle that we all have. One, the struggle with the world within us that's battling our own desires, and two, the world that's around us, that's pressuring us to conform uh, to fit their pattern and mold. I've offered to you that this is a book about our identity, isn't it? We don't belong in this world properly. If we've accepted full citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, that's real home for us. And you just sang about your home far away. Um, our home is here too. The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said. He declared that. And because the Holy Spirit is present with us, we know that we are to live out kingdom values here and now, not just wait for it one day. We're to live that now, and we recognize the presence of Jesus here with us today and right now. We want to take that really seriously. So what does that look like in life? Well, if you're an exile living in a foreign land, that's the way Peter puts it, right? He says that means a lot of things. It means that we're to be different under the pressures of life. We're all gonna have pressures. You don't get to choose. You're all gonna have pressures. But because of Christ and his lordship, church, we're to be different. We're to face our trials with hope. We're to face our trials even with joy because our joy doesn't come from the circumstance. Our joy comes from our Lord. I've tried my best to just give a little summary of these bits of First Peter that we've gone through. And isn't it good to slow down with a book? not just to hear a few minutes on one Sunday and then just to walk away from it. Uh, I pray that this can be an important experience for us of really diving a little deeper into what's there in this, in this beautiful book. We're to dare to be different, to swim upstream. I think that if we're casual about our faith, we're drifting downstream. Uh, we don't swim upstream on purpose. <laughs> it takes a lot of intentionality and effort and if you take the values of Jesus that he offered in the kingdom, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, 
if you take his kingdom value seriously, you're going to stand out. And it might get a little bit uncomfortable. And Peter talks about that. He talks about that with people there in the first century, but boy, isn't that true today? We're going to stand out. And it's going to be painful. It's going to be difficult. I've had at least three conversations with people this very week who are just frustrated with the competing values of the world. And I think it's good to reopen the pages of Scripture and to try to make sense of our world. And actually, I think in this context, it does. And here's what it is. We're not home yet. We're just not home yet. Dare to be different. You're a minister. All of you are ministers. There aren't just a couple of ministers in the room. We're all ministers. We're all called to ministry. We're called a royal priesthood, and we've got work to do of bringing people to Jesus and bringing Jesus to people. Uh, you're in a battle. As we started looking there at uh, chapter 2 a little more closely, we know that there's a war waging inside of our souls, and there's a war waging with culture all around us all the time. And I offered you some strategies for battle. How about this one? This is Peter's main strategy for the battle we're in. Do you love it? Submit. <laughs> offered those words, and, and I offered them last Sunday as what I call the heartbeat of this epistle, of this letter. I really think it's the heartbeat. I think it's where the real pressure is for these people that Peter's writing to is they're under the authority of earthly people who don't love Jesus and aren't appreciative of their commitment. And so when their values are different than yours, but you're subject in an earthly way to them, how do you handle that? And Peter says, well, let's look at what Jesus did. We don't like that. We'd rather fight back, wouldn't we? We don't want to be sheep in this world. We want to be battle rams. Am I right? <laughs> and look, he was a sheep that went to slaughter. And under the Father's guidance. I didn't give you a new legalism about submission, so don't take my words out of context if you didn't listen last week, but they're important words. There is a time that the Spirit leads us to godly submission, and it's just something we don't like to hear. One more note about submission, just finishing my sermon from last week. I really meant to say this last week. If you want to practice the discipline of submission, the next time you're in a committee meeting or a board meeting, be purposeful about accepting someone else's idea that's not your own. <laughs> well, this gets really personal when you do that, right? <laughs> it's just a great example. It's not easy to do that. I love my own ideas. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> Submission is a very hard discipline, and, and Jesus is our master. He is the one that taught us to do that. And if we can't do that with each other, if we can't do that in our marriages, if we can't do that in our own families, we're going to have a hard time doing that with the Caesars of the world, <laughs> the emperors, the governors that we're told to submit to. So that was last week. I'll get off of it. But again, it's, it's really the heartbeat of Peter. And I think today is really an extension of that. A reminder, today I want to tell you simply that you are on a mission. You are not here accidentally that you and I, I believe, are not here in our culture haphazardly. God knows what he's doing. And I think in these words that we're going to read as follow-up to these important words of submission, I think there's some instruction here, some reminder that the way we respond to the world around us really matters. The way we live our lives here and now really matters for an eternal purpose. We like the temporary purposes, we get hung up on those. But we're here also for an eternal purpose. So I want to encourage you to hear some words about mission from First Peter today. Would you stand with me as you're able? I'm reading from First Peter 3, and I'll jump in with verse 8. Notice Peter says the word finally, and the just for fun, turn the page. Oh, there's a chapter 4. Wait, there's a chapter 5. He's just like a preacher. What does it mean? <laughs> When they say in conclusion, what does that even mean? The definition of optimism is when the preacher says in conclusion, you slide your shoes back on. <laughs> Peter will have more to say, but he feels very strongly about this. Finally, all of you be like-minded. What's like-minded? The same as Jesus submitting. 
having that attitude of servanthood, be a slave to God, love each other. So be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Does that collide with the world's values a little bit or what we want to do sometimes? In fact, he says, quoting Jesus, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called. Would you turn to someone else and say you were called to bless others? Graduates, you're looking for purpose and direction. There's a purpose in life right there. You were called so that you may inherit a blessing because it's coming later. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil. Oh, Peter, this is hard stuff. And their lips from deceitful speech, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. We always think that peacemakers, you know, being a peacemaker is something that's passive, but it's very active. It's something that we pursue. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God opposes the proud. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, because that's a reality in the world. You are blessed. Do you believe it? Don't fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Friends, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope to everyone who asks you. The hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It's better, if it's God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. He comes back to Jesus. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. I love how preachers... Um, use one thing to talk about something else that's, wow, watch this. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, but not by the removal of dirt from the body. You see how he's not going to conclude his sermon right away? He just keeps going. But by the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. The sacrament's not just getting the dirt off your skin, right? It's about cleansing your heart. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And may God remind us of that picture, that Jesus today is in control. He's on the throne. And all creation, seen and unseen, worships him. Please be seated. What stands out to me in this passage is verse 15. I don't want to keep taking different portions of Peter as fairly as I can and say, where's Peter really going with this? And look at this book from these different angles. So I want you to think about verse 15 today. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, period. Caesar's not Lord. Your human nature and your flesh is not Lord. The temporary circumstances that you're so frustrated about and hurt by and everything else, those aren't Lord, but revere Jesus in your heart as Lord. And Peter's saying that makes a big difference. In fact, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. I'll tell you why I love this verse. It's because it assumes that other people are asking questions. Are you with me? 
When you think of evangelism, is that a positive word or a negative word? Should be positive, and it's very possibly quite negative to some as well. Because they hear being pushy. They hear being aggressive. They hear <laughs> putting your foot in the door, not letting them shut the door. <laughs> right? Peter's evangelism is a little bit different. It says, live such a good life, be so filled with hope, that other people notice it, and they ask you about it. Do you notice that that's the assumption behind this verse? Just, I want to make sure you're with me, because it's kind of the way I want you to see this whole passage. Always be ready to give an answer. What does that mean? It means others have noticed that your life is different, that you're swimming upstream, that you are joyful under trials, that you are gentle when others are aggressive. So much so that it's a witness and they ask you, why in the world are you that way? As a first point, I, I'm just going to offer, to me, this challenges us. It, it af offers for me personally two questions. I'm just going to give you my two questions. Am I willing to live a life that draws questions? That's the challenge to me of Peter and this passage. We're to give an answer. That means that somebody's asking the question, are you willing to be different? Are, are you willing to follow Jesus that much to where people are just at some point going to ask you? The problem with being different in this world, with being kingdom citizens, resident aliens here, and taking that really seriously, is that we are all social birds. There's something in us that's just wired to need each other. And so we very naturally look to the people around us for affirmation. And when we don't get that affirmation, it's very hurtful. I read something about chickens that I, just reminds me so much of people. And this article talked about raising chickens and what to do when other chicks peck little chicks to death. And as I read this article, and I checked out another one just to make sure this is really true because I've never raised chickens. Chicks are violent. And, and I mean the birds. I'm just, <laughs> the birds. <laughs> They're difficult. <laughs> Baby chickens are brutal, especially if one of the baby chicks demonstrates weakness or is injured. If they do that, they will literally peck it to death. So if you're raising chickens, they tell you to get that one out of there when you notice that. And what they're doing is they're establishing a pecking order. They're establishing a social order. What's ironic is they need each other and they want to be in relationship and that's hazardous to them. This made me think so much of how true that is for us as well. We so want and need to belong somewhere. And we look for our belonging in places that sometimes will injure us, sometimes will hurt us very much. If we're just following the kingdom order of this world and not the kingdom order of Jesus, the politics of this world say our goal is to defeat others. From a purely biological standpoint, if a bird as a chick is able to kill all of its siblings, that's the best thing for it because it'll get all of the nutrition. And life is, is a series of competition as to who is the strongest and who is going to get fed. And I think that's a good summary of our culture. I think that's a good summary of human nature at its worst, is that we can be that way with others. We can be that way as churches. We can be that way as cliques. We can be that way as countries where we do not see ourselves in cooperation, but we see ourselves in competition with others. Now consider the politics of Jesus. They're so very different. He on purpose did not defend himself. He on purpose laid down his life for sin. And he says, that that's the way, that's the attitude that we're to have 
in this very harsh environment and nest that we live in. I'm going to remind you again that the people Peter is writing to, some of them will die for their faith. It's not right. It's certainly not, not, not what God wills or God intends. But God so loves us and desires for us to love him back, he gives us free will. And we really make a mess of things <laughs> with our free will. And somewhere, somebody has got to be the body of Jesus in this world. And it's the church. And we've got to be people who resemble Jesus. How can you be hopeful in the chicken coop of this world? In the cruelty of all of it, in the injustice that you see and that you know. How can we be hopeful people? Well, I really do think it's by focusing on our citizenship in heaven. It's by focusing on our Savior. Last week when I talked to you about submission, and there's some really difficult words in First Peter, he pulls no punches. I offered to you that this isn't a new legalism. You don't just quote this verse at people that you demand that they submit to you, etc., etc., but we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit and what he has to say to us through his word. Even Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane said, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, but yours. So church, how about us? Do we have that attitude? Are we also willing to say God's will more than my will? in this situation where I want to get ahead. We, we all want the early worm, right? Are you hungry for the worms? <laughs> we had a robin's nest in our backyard, and so we did a little looking, because we were curious as to how long we had to put up with the mess and everything else. Because, <laughs> unlike other people I know, they don't just bash the nest down and get rid of them all. <laughs> We're just too tenderhearted, I guess. They do make a mess. But did you know a baby robin eats 14 feet of worm in two weeks before it leaves the nest? I just have a new respect for motherhood. <laughs> we watch this poor bird fly back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Totally off topic. But we all have needs. And we all have wants, and that's the source of our conflict, is that they butt heads with somebody else next to us that has needs and that has wants. And as the Holy Spirit leads, I pray that God would teach us to excel in this grace of kindness to each other. That God would help us to be gracious, and that God would help us to be joyful when there's just no other reason to be joyful except this. We have hope. Jesus, who became flesh and came into this world, came as a baby in a manger. Vulnerable. Small. Fragile. God the Father who sent Jesus into this world knew full well what would happen to this baby in the hands of humanity. That he would be misunderstood that he would be criticized, that he would be ridiculed, that he would be beaten, that he would be sentenced, that he would be spit upon, that every shred of dignity that he could have, a beard as a man would be removed, his clothing would be stripped, his back, the flesh, would be broken. And he would go to a cross willingly. God knew that and sent Jesus into this world. Because if there aren't people in this world who are willing to live out the way of Jesus, there is no hope. 
that has to end somewhere. Another part two of last week's sermon about husbands and wives. <laughs> I often have couples who are in deep conflict that ask for help. And when they do, they are just furious with each other. And they often just want to vent. And I, I won't meet with one spouse and just hear the venting. We have to sit down together if you're going to complain. <laughs> and they get to a point that basically sounds like this. Well, he doesn't deserve for me to be respectful to him. And she doesn't deserve for me to be compassionate and loving toward her as she wants. And we're in this crazy cycle. So he's depriving her of her needs and she's depriving him of his needs. And I tell him, I said, you know, actually the Bible says which one of you is supposed to initiate the first step of kindness. Because it sounds like you know what he wants and you know what she wants, but neither of you are willing because you're holding out on each other. I say, the Bible actually says who is supposed to take this first step. Now, do you know who that is? You do know. <laughs> Oftentimes I hear the husband from the wife. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't. But the answer is, the one who should take the first step in that kind of conflict is the partner who considers himself the most mature. The one in the relationship who believes that they are closest to Jesus should be the one to take the first step. It's not gender specific. I know for me, I first read that in a book called Love and Respect. It was a real eye opener. I'd rather somebody else be Jesus today, not me. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> but we are called to be questionable people. I almost called this, are you willing to live a questionable life? <laughs> but that's what it is. It's very questionable if you're willing to be vulnerable, if you're willing to be gentle, and if you're willing to show respect when it's not returned. And to hope and to trust that that is something God can do in his care as a witness to someone who really needs it. Am I living a life that draws question? I have part two to this. And part of me wants to say, I want to geek out a little bit about sacraments. I'll refrain a little bit. But did you notice it talks about baptism and, the, and it's not the removal of the dirt from your skin that saves you, but it's the resurrection of Jesus and it's a, a clear conscience before God. I, I love that language because Peter talks about not just a ritual, but he talks about an experience with God that changes us from the inside out. I, I love that. And, and I want to say at this first point, there's only two of them, don't worry. I want to say at this first point that your whole life is a sacrament. The way you talk to other people what you give or don't give, your tone of voice, your service to one another. A sacrament is an outward thing that we do that's supposed to point to Jesus. And, and our whole life, all of it, is to be lived from the inside out as a sacrament pointing to Jesus. In that way, our lives preach. And, and I pray that they do. I pray that your life is, is so different, and you're so hopeful in it. Not that you're sour. Notice they don't ask for the reason that you're sour. They ask for the reason that you're hopeful. As that happens, I believe it's something that the Holy Spirit uses to transform from the inside out. That's, you know, a sacrament imparts grace, and, and I believe that our lives are to impart grace. God's grace to a world that's so hungry to see it. They won't come to a communion table. They won't come to a baptismal necessarily. They will come to you first. And they'll be so curious as to why you love them so much when they're unlovable. Why you care about them so much when they return that grace with dishonor. Living a questionable life. Second question. 
do I speak to others about Jesus? I didn't know how more plainly to ask this question, so I just did. Do you speak to others about Jesus? Again, from this very verse, we are to be prepared to say something. You know, there's an old quote out there. I've used it myself. It's attributed to St. Francis. Let your life preach, use words if necessary. And, and I kind of like the message of that. I think it's pretty cool. I, you know, I, I've used it for years, and I, I did some reading on it this week. It actually couldn't have been St. Francis. So that was interesting. So you can read about that on your own. So that was kind of debunked that it was his. Well, that was disappointing. <laughs> I like St. Francis. He's pretty cool, uh, you know, getting along with the animals and all the good stuff that he did. But it wasn't his. But I read some stuff about it that really made me think. The problem with that phrase, preach always, use words if necessary, is it almost communicates that you shouldn't use words. It almost communicates that as a very last resort, you should say something. Whereas the thrust of the New Testament is what? Speak up. Share. How are they going to know if you don't tell them? You know, the let your life preach and your life as a sacrament is a Quaker thing. We, we, we think we have a, a pretty great history to be proud of, that with our integrity, we've shined the light of Jesus in this world, and I pray that we have. But in some ways, as a personality, as a denomination, I think we're very quiet. And, and I think we struggle with this one. But the scripture says, be prepared. And, and I do think that means discipline your mind, understand your salvation. I believe all adults should be in some kind of Bible study with other people, period. I just do. I know there's other great resources on the internet and you can read and everything else, but I just think it's so valuable to be sharing that experience with others. And Tom doesn't brag about himself, but I will. Did you know he's a doctorate in ministry? He's finishing a class on the book of Romans. He's just mortified that I'm singling him out like that. But Tom, you're a gift to us. And your mind is disciplined. And you've studied scripture in such a way that we need it. So thank you for teaching. And he's starting a class on the Reformation next week. Just saying. 11 o'clock. It's right there. It's like 30 steps. And there's usually like donuts between here and there. It's, it's not a hard journey. <laughs> And others of you study with small groups and, and women's study and men's. I love that. But just somewhere, 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 be challenged in your mind. Because I think otherwise, if we don't understand our faith, we're not ready to articulate it. Can you write down in a very succinct way what salvation is all about? I think that's so important. Many of you who've been through our membership process know that what we like to do is ask you to write out your testimony. And I, I really do that for your benefit more than anybody else's because the first time I wrote out my testimony, I was shocked. Of all things, I was like you, kind of looking at the dirt, kicking, I was shocked, so I don't have a testimony. So, wow. I suddenly realized that God rescued me. I didn't honor him for it. I wasn't ready to share with somebody else in the same circumstances because I'd really never thought about it. And I encourage you to do that. I think part of being ready to give an answer is to really think through your experience with Jesus. How has he changed you? What did that look like? What did you used to struggle with? What questions do you still have that God allows you to move forward with as a faith thing? We're all strugglers. But to write out the difference, when did you make that commitment to Jesus? You know, I attended a wedding last night. It's a beautiful ceremony with Skylar Messick, if you can believe that. He's old enough to get married. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> and we had assigned tables, and I ended up walking away from that with Teresa saying, those were divinely assigned tables to me. Because I sat around the table with people that I've known for a very long time, and somebody just started asking, like you do at a wedding, how did you meet your wife or husband? And we just started that way. But all of a sudden, I won't mention any names, because if I mention the first name Charmaine, you'll think, <laughs> I know a lot of Charmaines. It could be anybody. 
she says as only she could, God always ought to be mentioned and emphasized in a ceremony. And he was in this one. But she had recently been to one where he wasn't. And, and she mentioned that. It's, I, I, I love Charlene. <laughs> but she said that, and it just sparked this conversation to where we went around the table literally and asked, when did you make a commitment to Jesus? What did that look like? And it was the coolest thing because it wasn't like a pastor making you write an essay for membership. It was just friends around a table genuinely sharing, this is what it looked like for me. I loved that. I actually learned things about people I didn't know about, even though I've known them for decades. Always be ready to share that. Talk about it. I'm saying for me, they weren't there to convert me <laughs> to Christianity. It was a huge encouragement to me to listen to their story. And I think we need to be better at that, at, at, at figuring out how to, to talk freely about our testimony. Because we talk well about other things. Um, I will look for McKenna BSU games on TV. We can talk about BSU football really easily. But it's harder to talk about, this is something Jesus freed me from because I came to know him and I struggled with that for years. We have a much harder time going deeper and, and really talking about our faith. And I, I think if you don't talk about casual things like the Denver Broncos are the best team, right? And all of DSU hopes to play for them. <laughs> like D.L. Skinner. If we can't joke around and talk about small things, we're not gonna be really good at talking about deep things. So they go together. But Quakers, friends, we have to get around to talking about the deep things. And we need to be able to share our testimony. We need to be able to share the gospel. Because not only are our words a sacrament, well, not, I blew it. Not only are our lives a sacrament, but our words are a sacrament. They are to point to Jesus. Our words, and there's emphasis on words in here, as you saw, our words are to impart grace to a hungry world around us as well. Are you willing to share your story with others? Are you willing to speak to those who don't know Jesus as the Spirit prompts you to do that? Are you prepared to do it? What would you say? I think that's a good question. I think that's what this verse should jar us to ask. One, is my life a really good presentation for the gospel to begin with? Are they going to want to ask me about my hope? But two, when they do, am I actually willing to say it? I find that you have a very brief window often with people. And they will often bring it up. They will ask you for your hope. Sometimes it doesn't look like the way you think. You know, how, how did you handle that pressure in your marriage or whatever else it was? Are you willing to speak out the name of Jesus? Say, you know, my marriage only is what it is because of Jesus. It's grace. It could be just a simple thing to say. Some of you are really good at it, by the way. You say it with store clerks. And, it, you know, I'm blessed. I know who I belong to. Simple comments. I admire that. It's often the people we know the best that we have a hard time doing that with. We're afraid of being ostracized because we're going to have to share this nest with them. They're, they're still going to live with me. <laughs> or they're still going to be my next-door neighbor. Or they're still going to be in the office. And what are they... What are they going to think if they find out that I'm a Jesus freak? <laughs> what will they do when they find out it's true? Are you willing to speak? I'm going to end with a couple of passages of scripture and then a story. Matthew 5.16, friends. In the same way, let your light shine before others 
so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Proverbs 14.25, a truthful witness saves lives. Will you speak? But one who breathes out lies is deceitful. Are we hiding our identity? Acts 10.42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Matthew 5.15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Romans 10.14-15, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard of? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And then Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I read this article from Wycliffe Bible Translators. A band of brave souls became known as one-way missionaries two centuries ago. They bought tickets to the mission field without the return half. Instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings into coffins. Do you get that? As they sailed away, they waved goodbye to everyone, knowing they'd never return home. A.W. Milne, who died in 1822, was one of those missionaries. He set sail for the new for uh, an island, a small island in the South Pacific, aware that headhunters there had martyred every missionary before him. Milne did not fear for his life because he had already died to himself. His coffin was packed. For 35 years, he lived among that tribe. When he died, they buried him in the middle of the village and inscribed this on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Let's pray. Gracious Jesus, help us to be light, and I pray that you would infuse us with both a courage and a gentleness that comes from your Holy Spirit. Let our lives preach. Let our lives, even of submission and kindness and gentleness and service, let our lives be hopeful and different, that they might evoke the curiosity of people who so need and desire connection with you. And Jesus, make us ready. Help us to be disciplined and intentional with readiness and willingness to speak of your hope. Lord, find us to be a church that's truly on mission. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.